All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. We've been taking a few months going through the book of Exodus, a lot of uh, amazing scenes that we've been looking at. The Apostle Paul tells us that all these things we read about in the Old Testament were given for our, as an example for us, how to live, uh, what not to do, what to do. And so we uh, tie all this in together with what we know of the New Testament, the New Covenant. But God's Word is sure uh, from Genesis to Revelation. It is all His Word. So let's open up a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, as we come before you, we just thank you that you have given us all that we need for life and godliness. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your Holy Word. And we pray that your Word would take root in our lives and produce good fruit. Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would empower us to live the kind of life that brings glory and honor to you. Lord, in the weakness of our flesh, we stumble, we fall. But Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to pick us up, to cleanse our hearts, renew our minds once again. And Lord, hopefully we learn over time to depend more on you and less on ourselves. So Father, we commit this time to you and pray that your word would speak loud and clear to each one of us. And we thank you that you are with us always, even to the end of this age. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in Exodus 32. This has got to be one of the lowest moments in the life of Moses, unfortunately. I mean, after everything God has done for the children of Israel, we'll see that they quickly turn their backs on God. Um, again, we've all witnessed what God has done, delivering them from their bondage in Egypt, where God sent the 10 plagues. After 400 years in, uh, of captivity in Egypt, God sends the 10 plagues upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, upon the nation of Egypt, and... God sets them free. Uh, he parts the Red Sea. The Israelites go on dry land. He brings the Red Sea waters upon the army of Egypt and destroys them. Um, they were just amazed at all the uh, ways God blessed them. I mean, he gave them manna from heaven, fed them every day, gave them water from the rock. Uh, they get to the base of Mount Sinai, and, you know, they, they see the thunder, the lightning, uh, they've got the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. I mean, God's presence, His uh, ministry among them is evident to all. They heard His voice when God gave them the Ten Commandments back in chapter 20. And then twice that we have seen in chapter 19, verse 8, and then in chapter 24, verse 3, when the Israelites experienced all these things from God, when they heard the voice of the Lord, they tell Moses, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. So now we're 40 days later, and no, we don't. They blow it big time. Uh, they set up this image of this gold calf. They begin to worship this. They proclaim, this is our God, and this will become the reason why this is the lowest moment in the life of Moses. Again, God has just finished giving Moses all the plans, the blueprints for the construction of the tabernacle, all the you know furniture that's going to go in the tabernacle, all the instructions about making the priestly garments, all the sacrificial system that will be implemented. I mean, he has given God, or God has given Moses everything that they need. And so at the very end of uh, the chapter 31, the last verse, it says, when he, the Lord had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai. He gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, that's the Ten Commandments, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That must have been awesome to watch God write with his finger on those two tablets of stone. So Moses, now he makes his way down from Mount Sinai. And in the meantime, we pick up in chapter 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. 
Oh, how quickly we are prone to forget the things of the Lord. It's only been 40 days, and the people are thinking, they're speculating, well, something must have happened to Moses. Maybe one of those lightning bolts up on the mountain struck him and he's dead. You know, maybe, you know, he got lost up there. Maybe we don't know what happened, so let's make ourselves a, a god. We see a number of problems that they had with this first verse here. Number one, one problem is, notice who they said has brought them out of the land of Egypt. They give the credit to Moses. Moses did not lead them out of the land of Egypt. God did. So that's problem number one. You know, another problem we see is that a huge mistake is how quickly they forgot the Ten Commandments. They heard the Ten Commandments. We're told that they were hearing when God spoke in chapter 20. They could all hear God give them the commandments. And the first thing God said was, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then he gives them the first commandment, which was, you shall have no other gods before me. And so now they say, make us a God that can, you know, lead us on. The second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, nor bow down and serve them. So we see that the Israelites, they had a weight problem, not a weight as in diet problem. They had a weight as in patience problem. You know, it's rather ironic that the Israelites waited over 400 years to be delivered by God out of Egypt. They, they couldn't even wait 40 days for Moses to come back down from the mountain. Oftentimes, our impatience causes us to become impulsive. And I don't know about you, but I've done this a number of times over the years where I think, God, you're just moving too slow. I think I need to intervene here, God. I think I need to do something about this. This is probably what you had in mind, but it's not even close to what God had in mind. And so you stumble along, you bumble along. And over the years, you start to realize God knows exactly what he's doing. He's you know, in control. His timing is perfect. If we would just wait upon the Lord, we know that he will work things out. And so we need to learn how to patiently wait for God to open up doors. And when he does, then go through the doors that he opens. But when we try to kick doors open, it never turns out too well. The reality is how we handle delays and waitings is one of the best indicators of our maturity and our growth in the Lord, how we handle waiting on the Lord. God is always working together for our good and for His glory, but the problem on our part is that we can't see all the stuff that He's doing. We can't see what He wants to do tomorrow or next week, and so all we see is the here and now, and so a lot of times we'll become impatient. And so this is why we need to walk by faith Walk by trust in the Lord and what His Word has revealed to us. Do you believe that the Lord loves you? I mean, that needs to be the first and foremost in your mind. I know God loves me. I know He has a good plan for my life. Do you realize He is in control? Do you know that He wants what is best for you? Not what you think is best, but God knows what is best. So we need to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, a very short verse. Paul says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is so important. You know, we just trust that the Lord, He's going before us. We trust what His Word says, that He does love us. He does care for us. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. This is why one of the distinctives of Calvary Chapel is to go verse by verse through God's Word, because this is how your faith grows, not by just some sermonette that some guy gives for Christianettes. It comes from God's living Word and the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God. He transforms us. He builds our faith, strengthens our faith. And so we need to learn to patiently wait upon the Lord. We need to be patient as we wait for the Lord. We're living in the last days. Uh, the rapture could happen in any moment, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
We're going to be caught up into his presence. This mortal will put on immortality. This body of corruption will put on incorruption. It's going to happen that fast. And so are we patiently waiting for the Lord? This is what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And he's speaking about the rapture here. Starting in verse 42, he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing." Surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But, here's the impatient one, if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites." There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so don't grow impatient as you're waiting for the Lord. The, the rapture is going to take place when the rapture takes place. Nobody knows the day or the hour. You know, Pastor Chuck used to say, live each day as if this is your last day, but plan your life as if you got the rest of your life to live it out. We don't know. But we need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We need to walk in the power and the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. So look at verse 2. They're growing very impatient. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in, your, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Now, wouldn't it have been wonderful for Aaron to say, You know what? Let's pray. Or to say, What are you people thinking? We're not going to make a god. We're not going to make some gold image. And so we see here he stumbles, he blows it, he's Israel's first high priest, and he is a godly man who has a very big flaw. And that is, he wanted the approval of people, rather than to be approved by God. He wanted to be liked by the people, rather than to walk in the love of God. So rather than lead the people to follow the Lord, he lets the people lead him away from the Lord. Now, sometimes we can be pleasing to the Lord and pleasing to people, but sometimes the two are diametrically opposed. The apostles were told by the religious leaders, stop speaking in the name of Jesus. You're spreading this doctrine throughout Jerusalem. Shut up is what they're telling the, the, the disciples. And so we read this in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. They're not being politically correct here. You know, you murdered him. You put him on a tree. You put him on the cross. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things and also to the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. That's the bottom line. You got to be pleasing to the Lord first and foremost. If people are pleased with that, great. If they're not, too bad. You know, I've had a lot of people get upset with me just by teaching God's word. And they're offended because I taught God's words. Like, don't blame me, blame the author of the book. Take it up with God. That's where your problem is. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, Paul says, But as we have been entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. You'll be secure as you trust the Lord. You know, and you're not putting your 
fear in men and what they tell you to do, but you've put your fear in the Lord. A healthy fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. And we want to be pleasing to God and don't worry about what man says. Sometimes, again, they might say, well, that's good. I'm glad you're standing up for the word of God. Other times they'll say, you need to be quiet. You know, you need to more, be more whatever, tolerating. Verse 3, so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, because Aaron told them to, and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. How ridiculous. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So the people, they're all excited as they take off their gold earrings, they bring them to Aaron, and he meticulously makes this gold calf. He's got an engraving tool, and he's molding this thing. He fashions it into a gold calf. Why a gold calf? Because that was one of the things the people in Egypt worshipped, was the calf, the ox, the bull. It was a sign of fertility and power. And so... When the people see it, they go wild. They're all excited. And what it says in that final you know, phrase there, they sat down to eat and drink. They rose up to play. It literally means they are having an orgy. They're just partying. They're having sexual immorality. It's just rebellion against God and his word. And as verse 4 says, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron sees their enthusiasm, he builds an altar for this idol. Now, what he says in verse 5 is really troubling because he says tomorrow is a feast day to the Lord. The word Lord there is Yahweh. We're going to worship this thing as Yahweh. He's trying to mix and merge their pagan practices together with their worship of the one true God. There's a word for that. It's called syncretism. Syncretism is when you take these two opposing ideas and you bring them together and you try to make one good idea out of it. But it's usually never a good idea, especially when it comes to religion. You try to merge two ideas together and you come up with something to be more inclusive, to be more tolerant. Let me just say that when it comes to biblical Christianity, it's never a good idea to mix that with anything else. The gospel of Christ And the word of God and the atoning work of Jesus on the cross for our sins, the shedding of his blood, the the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit within our lives is all sufficient on their own. A bad example of syncretism is when Christian churches try to be culturally relevant. And they'll tell you this flat out all the time. We just want to be culturally relevant. Well, guess who loses? The church loses. They bring the culture in, the wickedness of the world. They bring in and it waters down the word of God. They try to water down the Christian influence. It's supposed to be the other way around. We are to be an influence to those culture around us. This is what Jesus says. You're the light of the world. You're to be salt. If the salt loses its savor, then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. That's where we see so many churches today. They don't stand for the word of God. They've let culture in, and it becomes this mishmash of all these things that just weaken the the church as a whole. And, And pretty soon, the word of God gets replaced with all kinds, as Paul says, the vain philosophies of men. And again, we see it all around us. Instead of sermons... From God's word, teaching us and telling us about sin and repentance and obedience to God's word, about denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily, following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, syncretism creeps in and you'll get sermons about your felt needs. Oh, how can we make you feel better about living in your sin? That's what they're telling people. We just want you to feel good about yourself. And they'll tell you how to live your best life now. 
They have all these different so-called non-offensive sermons that just tell people how good they are, how wonderful they are, how God just wants to make you happy and healthy and wealthy. And if you're not, it's because of your lack of faith. And that's baloney. Sometimes you go through trials and tribulations because the Lord puts you in trials and tribulations because he's trying to mature you and grow you. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. The Apostle Paul says, you know, that if you're going to be in this world as a Christian, you will face persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The Apostle Paul was sick. He had a thorn in his flesh. Whatever it was, he prayed three times, Lord, please take this away from me. God said, no, my grace is sufficient. He tells Timothy, who had these stomach issues, take a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments. God can heal instantly, and I've seen him heal people instantly. Sometimes he doesn't, but his grace is sufficient to get you through whatever you're going through. And so when you have these churches saying, well, you should always be healthy, you should always be wealthy, you should always be happy, don't buy into that. That is syncretism. They're trying to mix the philosophies of this world, which is all about your best life now, into the Word of God. And so when you go to churches like that, it's where... You know, they they will hear what their flesh wants to hear, not what God's Word says. And this is what the Apostle Paul warns about. This is what he warns Timothy about, 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 5. He says, preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort. Oh, those are nice words, convince, rebuke. Sometimes you got to rebuke Christians, you're living like the world, repent. Turn back to Jesus before you get yourself into bigger trouble. That's out of love you say those things, not because you're mean or nasty. He says, convince, rebuke, exhort with all patience, long-suffering, and teaching. For the time will come, and as I've said for years, it's already here. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's from God's Word. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, And they will turn their ears away from the truth, that's the truth of God's word, and be turned aside to fables. Like God wants everyone in here to be wealthy. He wants every one of you to be healthy. You're not going to be healthy and wealthy until you stand in the presence of God. You might be earthly wealthy, but that's going to burn up. But when we stand face to face with Jesus, then you'll have no more pain, no more sorrow. You'll be walking on streets of gold. That's not promised in the here and now, but they turn their ears away from the truth to be turned aside to fables, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So whatever your ministry is, whatever God's called you to do, then you do it as unto the Lord. So when syncretism takes place, truth will always get pushed aside. And eventually it'll lead to compromise, to tolerance, and then acceptance of unbiblical practices In other words, immorality will become the new normal. And then you and I, mostly me, you get labeled as, you're intolerant. You're this phobic, you're that phobic. And it's like, I'm not phobic. I love sinners, but I hate sin. I was a wicked sinner before I got saved. Jesus loved me. He loves sinners. That's why he sent Jesus to die for our sins. So you don't hate people. You don't go around judging people and say, oh, they're living this kind of lifestyle. Oh, God hates them. No, he doesn't. Otherwise, we'd all be vaporized because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So he sent Jesus to die for us. But we've got to tell people, unless you repent and turn to Christ and be forgiven, you will die in your sins. You'll be separated from God for eternity. His love has demonstrated that Christ went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. The truth never changes. God's word is still God's word. The bottom line is we must obey God rather than men. We must hold fast to God's living word and not mix it, not blend it with the philosophies of this sinful world. One of the worst examples of syncretism in the history of the church happened during the days of Constantine. Constantine was a Roman emperor. He supposedly gets saved, and towards the end of his life, he wanted to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
It didn't become the official religion of the Roman Empire until after he died. The next empire makes it the official religion. And so instead of everybody saying, okay, you got to repent and turn to Christ, receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you'll be born again, they made all these pagans come into the Christian church, and the pagans said, oh, okay. So they brought in all their pagan idols. They brought in their pagan ideas. And they brought in all these things, syncretism, that watered down the church. And so you ended up with people worshiping Mary. Where did that come from? Isis and Horus. The pagans are already worshiping the mother and child. So they worship Mary. And then it's like, well, Jesus is too busy, and so we better talk to his mom. That's not biblical, folks. And, and then they bring in worship of and prayers to saints. That's not biblical. And then if you die and you're not in good standing as a, a, that part of the religion, you end up in a place called purgatory, and your, your sins will get dealt with in purgatory. But if you want them to get out faster, you pay the church indulgences. This is how the church got so wealthy for that thousand years known as the Dark Ages. All these indulgences were paid to the church so you could get your loved ones out of purgatory faster. How would you know it even happened? There's no such place as purgatory anyway. These were all brought in by these pagans. Syncretism. And it just kept building and building. And then pretty soon, the priesthood took over. And the top dog in Rome, he's the vicar of Christ. What does that mean? He's the substitute for Christ. He is Christ on earth. So whatever the Pope would say, they have to go along with it because that takes precedence over God's word. That's no different than the Mormon church. Oh, we believe the Bible is the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly, but we've also got all these other books we've added to it. That's syncretism. It never does the Bible any good. It always tears things down. There's one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. So what Aaron does here with this gold calf was just another one of Satan's attempts to destroy the Word of God. His first attempt, as you know, is in the Garden of Eden. When he tells Eve, did God really say Oh, surely you won't die. You'll become just like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that's a lie of so many cults today. You don't need God. You are a God yourself, or you can become a God. You'll be on your own planet with your celestial wives and all this other nonsense. It's not biblical. Be careful. Adam and Eve's sin brought death into this world. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin and death would continue until Jesus Christ came on the scene. And he would die for our sins. He would rise from the grave in order to give people eternal life to those who would put their faith and trust in him alone. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, For in Adam... All die, you know, that's, we've all been born in, with a sin nature. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. What does that mean to be in Christ? It means you're born again. You're a new creation in Christ. And once somebody's saved, then you go from death to life. Now we have this living hope of seeing the Lord face to face in glory. But this mixing and merging of biblical truth with Satan's lies is nothing new. And unfortunately, it's found all over the world today. But only God's word is the word of God, and it will always stand alone as God's truth. I mean, I just thought of this. I didn't mention it first service, but you look at this whole thing with evolution and creationism and churches that try to blend the two together. Oh, we're billions and billions of years old. We can't prove it. There's no evidence for it, but we can't believe Genesis 1. So that's syncretism. Same thing, nothing new under the sun. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You either believe it or you don't. Jesus quoted from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The most quotes out of the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy. Jesus quotes from there because he knows this is God's word. This doesn't just contain some truths about God. The entire Bible is God's truth to us. I better speed it up here. Verse 7. <laughs> We're going to go through the whole chapter. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, here we see an interesting exchange between God and Moses. First of all, God says, look at what your people are doing, Moses. Now, God knows they're not Moses' people. God has already said, these are my special people. These are my chosen people. He's obviously putting Moses to the test here. He wants to see where Moses' heart is. Look at verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Again, this is a test. And does Moses pass this test? Absolutely. God would have been perfectly justified to say, you know what? I'm going to wipe them all out. And God could have, because they've all sinned. He could wipe every one of us in here out, because we've all sinned. He could start over with somebody else. But guess what, Moses? You're a sinner too. And your descendants are going to be sinners. And so he could start over with Moses. And pretty soon, a couple generations down, he'd have to wipe them all out because they've all sinned. That's not the heart of God. But he's testing Moses here. And watch how he passes the test. Verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember, and now he's quoting from Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Again, this really shows where Moses' heart is. He was more concerned about God's reputation than about his own future. I mean, this is a beautiful example of intercessory prayer. Lord, I know we're stubborn. I, I know that people are stubborn, but they're not my people. These are your people. And God knew all along. He says, I didn't deliver them. You delivered them, Lord. So all the glory has to go to you. And I love how he uses the word of God when he prays here in verse 13, because over and over in Genesis, God tells Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob, Israel, I'm bringing you back, because they were in the promised land. I'm bringing you back to the promised land. Your descendants will be in the promised land. What is a promised land? My land is Israel. There's no such place as Palestine, by the way. It's always been Israel. Always will be Israel. It's God's land. He brought his people back. He even promised that in the last days you'd bring them back in unbelief to their land. And he's done that. We're seeing God at work even today. So this was the test that God had for Moses. Did Moses really love the people? Was he concerned about their future? The answer was absolutely, and so he passes the test. When God puts you and me through a test, it's for the same reason. He wants to reveal what is really in our hearts. And if there's anything in our lives that needs to be changed, then God will point those things out. Not because he's a meanie, not because he's upset with us, it's like, Jeff, you blew it again. He's not mad at me. He just shows me, yeah, you did this, Jeff. I've got a better plan, a better way. And I can say, well, I'm going to keep doing it. And then you'll experience the backside of God's hand on your backside. Because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He loves us, but he wants us walking with him, not in rebellion against him. So it's so much easier just to confess, repent, say, Lord, I know you're right and I'm wrong. And then start doing things his way. Now look at verse 14. This has been misinterpreted for a lot of people here. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. At first glance, it looks like, wow, God's really torqued. 
He's really mad. He's going to smoke them all. He's going to burn them up. They deserve it. And he's going to wipe them out. And Moses came, comes along and he calms God down. No, he, that's, let me just say, that's not even close to what happened here. God is perfect. God is just. He is not like us. He's not wishy-washy. Oh, I'm going to get them now and I'm going to destroy them. Oh, okay, Moses, you talked me out of it. Not even close. God is immutable. That means he cannot change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Wait a minute. Go back. I skipped it. <laughs> Numbers 23, verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Again, he's immutable. He does not change. He cannot sin because he's perfect. So there's no need for God to repent because only you know, sinners repent. God could never sin because he's perfect. Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Again, since God cannot lie, because he is perfect and holy, there would never be a time where he would have to repent. So this word, relent, it's a difficult word to translate, but the, the Hebrew word, root word for this means to sigh. God is sighing over this. And we see the same thing with the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is sighing or grieving. We see the same thing with Jesus when he weeps over Jerusalem. That's what it refers to. God is grieving over his people who are sinning against him. He's grieving over the fact that they don't trust him. He's grieving over the fact they don't see how much God loves them. And so Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is Paul talking to the church, the Christians in Ephesus. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve him? When we start disobeying the Lord, we start doing things in our flesh, we start doing things opposite of what God's word tells us to do, that's grieving to the Lord. He's not going to just smoke you and take you out, although he could. There's a sin unto death that John talks about. That's a different message. Don't forget Jesus mourning over Jerusalem. When he's coming in in the triumphal entry, he overlooks the city there in Luke 19, starting in verse 41. It says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. That's that same idea where God is sighing. <sighs> and he, this is what Jesus said as he's sighing, as he's weeping. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He's referring to the specific day. It was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, the exact day he would ride victoriously into Jerusalem. If you only would have known that day. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. This is why he's weeping. He knows what's going to happen. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. 38 years later, General Titus of the Roman Empire comes into Jerusalem, slaughters one million Jews in Jerusalem, levels the temple, not one stone left upon another, because they did not know the time of their visitate, God's visitation. Here in Exodus, God sighs. It's almost as if he's saying to Moses, finally, somebody gets it. Finally, somebody's praying and crying out to me for mercy, for forgiveness. Finally, somebody's heart is broken over the sinful situation I see around me. There's people that are dying in our midst all around us, and, and God wants us to have a heart that's broken for the sinner. Yes, we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. And our hearts should break when we see people rebelling against God. And that's where Moses was. His heart was breaking because of what God could have done, and, and it was righteous in his righteous indignation could have done to the Israelites. That's what he's looking for. People who love those who are lost. People who grieve over the same thing God grieves over. God doesn't take pleasure when sinners die 
and go to hell. But heaven rejoices when one sinner repents and turns their life to Christ. Verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. Some see this as both sides of both tablets had the Ten Commandments on them. We usually picture five on one side, five on the other, or four and six. Be that as it may, the tablets were written on both sides, on one side and on the other, they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, remember Joshua spent 40 days on the mountain, about halfway down the mountain. He wasn't on the top with Moses, but he waited that whole time for 40 days, 40 nights. And he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Amazing. What an amazing scene this is. Multitudes worshiping, dancing around this. He's furious. He smashes. He breaks the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they were breaking God's law. It was just symbolic. They're breaking the law, so he breaks the commandments there, the the tablets of stone. And what the people are doing here, the Bible will call spiritual adultery. Anytime you worship someone, something other than the one true living God, you are committing spiritual adultery. So Moses burns it up. He grinds the gold into powder. He throws it in the water and makes the people drink it. Can I just say... If you can grind your God into powder, that's not a God worth following. That's not a God worth worshiping. You're following the wrong God. Now, why did he make the people drink it? Because he wanted them to have a bitter taste in their mouth. This is what your sin has done. And sin and rebellion against God will always leave bitter consequences. It'll make you sick. And even though we can be completely forgiven of all of our sins, sometimes the consequences of our sin, it'll linger linger for a while. Sometimes it'll linger because God wants us to keep that bad taste in our mouth so we don't go back to it. Sometimes it'll linger for a while because he wants us to realize just how amazing his grace is and how amazing his mercy is. And so he warns us, don't go back to those things. There's consequences. Verse 21 And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? It's like, what did they do to you, Aaron? Did they hold a knife to your throat? You know, did they torture you? Did they threaten to kill you? What in the world? How did this happen? Well, here's the worst excuse ever. Look at verse 22. So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people. (laughs) that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and out this calf came. And when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies." I mean, the audacity for Aaron to say, I didn't do anything wrong, Moses. We were all worried and sick about you. You didn't come down, and the people brought all this gold to me, and you know, I just threw it into the fire, and poof, out jumps his gold calf. If you think about it, Moses, it's a miracle. It's like that stupid commercial for the bathroom. People lined up at the house. It's a miracle. It's like, that's not a miracle. Oh, in one day, we changed our bathroom from this ugly little garbage pit to now it's shiny and all these people are looking at our bathroom. It's a miracle. That's not a miracle. This is not a miracle. He fashioned this thing. He engraved it. He made this gold calf. It's one thing to sin and we all do. And then we ask the Lord to forgive us and he will. But to sin and then lie about it, that just makes matters worse. 
Don't cover your sin. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, But if you do not do so, then take note you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. God sees. He knows. We got cameras in the building. <laughs> I'm just I'm kidding. No, I'm not, but I'm kidding. God sees. We don't need cameras. He sees everything we do. Best thing we can do when we sin is to humble ourselves before the Lord, confess our sins, so that we can experience what Peter says when we repent. Times of refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. So he's giving the whole nation an opportunity. Who wants to be on my side? Who wants to join up with the Lord? Only one out of the 12 tribes comes to his side, the tribe of Levi. Pretty sad state of conditions here. Verse 27, And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So the, the indication is these were still the ones worshiping the calf. These were still the ones that were still partying, even after the calf is ground down and they're drinking it. They're still worshiping this pagan idol, so to speak. So then Moses said in verse 29, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. Now this is a heavy-duty scene. The Levites, got to, they pull out their sharp twisted sword, they're going around, and they're killing those that are still worshiping, still partying, and 3,000 men, it says, about 3,000 died. Oh, what a sad practice, what a sad scene this is. But it's like cutting cancer out of a, you know, the camp of Israel. God didn't want it spreading. But here's a random thought. On the day Moses brings down the law from Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died. 1,500 years later, when the Holy Spirit comes down on the day of Pentecost, how many people got saved? About 3,000. That's a good contrast between the law and grace. The law brings death. The law wasn't given to make us righteous. It was to show us how unrighteous we are, Paul says. And the law brings us to Jesus. It's a tutor to bring us to Christ. And once we come to Christ and we're in His grace, that's when you come to salvation. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, The letter of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit brings life. Finally, look at verse 30. It says, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Again, the heart of Moses. He didn't want to see him perish. He wanted to see them live. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, here's his heart. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. But what a heart that Moses had for these people. He is literally willing to exchange his own personal relationship with God, his eternal salvation, you might say. I'll exchange that, Lord, for the people if you'll let them live. If you won't let them live, Lord, then just kill me. Take my name out of your book. Somebody else had that same heart of compassion for the Israelites, his fellow Jews. That was the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9. He said, oh, I just wish that I could give my life if it would mean their salvation. He knew it couldn't because a person is only saved by putting their faith alone in Christ alone. We must receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Let me close with a couple quick thoughts here. 
Again, there's a fine line between loving people and being a people pleaser. You will always be better off making God happy rather than trying to make people happy. Sometimes we'll be called to make people uncomfortable and unhappy in order for us to be pleasing to the Lord. And yes, we're to love others, but sometimes our love for God will put us on the hot seat with others. But we've got to stand up for what the Lord says. Also be careful, be extremely careful, especially in these last days, not to mix and blend the living word of God with the vain philosophies of men. It never works well. It never turns out good. No matter how sincere people might be in trying to blend their pagan ideas with God's word, they are sincerely wrong. Very clearly. I don't want to see you or me or any other Christian get sidetracked because we're listening to those who despise God's word, to those who mock God's word, and we're living in days in which so many people are, even in the church. So we need to pray and ask the Lord to give us ears to hear what His Spirit saying to each one of us from His word. Let me close with Proverbs 28, verse 13. A tremendous promise for all who will listen to the word of God. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. We're always better off just being open and honest with God, admitting our weaknesses, our frailties, our sins to the Lord, and allowing him to wash us clean, refresh our souls. Because if we don't, God has a way of putting the squeeze on our lives because he loves us not because he's trying to work us over. But when we do commit our ways to him, we will experience his grace, his mercy, his love to a greater degree than if we continue to live in rebellion.